So welcome. It seems that we're more people than before. That's quite nice. A lot of new faces. I'm Tommy. Uh, this doesn't work. This doesn't make my voice any louder. This is just for recording purposes. So whenever you want to say something today, please, well, let's use that so we can have good quality in the video. Um, so this is Darker Music Talks. For, for those who don't know, uh, we bring an expert, Andre, today, and musicians that want to learn something, and we have a discussion. That's an interactive thing, right? Um, we started this less than a year and a half ago, and it started because going to, to conferences and different symposiums or whatever, people talking about the future of music, there were some experts sitting, and there were some people watching, and it was as if they knew everything and we were consuming the truth, which is not what's happening. So realize that since the Q&A, every time is really short, and this is where the whole knowledge is at the Q&A, I realized that maybe it's better if we bring an expert and then we have just the Q&A. No people knowing everything and we have a discussion. So this is what this is about. It's about the discussion. So I really look forward to hearing what everybody has to say. This was probably going to be the most interactive workshop because we will come up with new, maybe unconventional ways of having revenue in music. So it's about discovering something new today. I really hope you participate. We have a very knowledgeable person today. He's, he's Andre from London Fusion. He will explain better what he does and his knowledge, his background. Um, if you don't want to pay attention and you want to be social, it's better if you use this hashtag so everybody can see what you're doing. Um, and the password for, for the Wi-Fi is innovation with a weird spelling. Um, so I really hope you enjoy. This is your stage, by the way, right? It's not about me. It's not about the expert. It's not about. It's about the knowledge and about the discussion. So feel free to talk, and uh, we'll speak later. Thank you, Tommy. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks for a good turnout today. Before I start, Tommy, my, I had a rucksack here. It's got my glasses in, so I'm half blind. So. Um, if you could track it down, that'd be good. That's the one, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so my name's um, Andre Le Quent Gale. Um, I work for Lancaster University Management School, and we are lead partner in London Fusion, which is, well then I will show you. So London Fusion, effectively, I'm gonna turn this around so everyone can see. Effectively, we provide business support to the creative and digital industries in London. So we've been given some money by the European Union just to help out this sector because there are a lot of problems, yet there are a lot of new companies in this creative and digital field. So we provide everything from free workshops, um, social media, sales, um, website strategy planning, whatever it might be, business modeling, which is something I teach. Um, and then we also do things like help you get access to funding if you need it, or try to get you into networks that can help you around London. So I've been doing this about two years. London Fusion has been going around the same time. So if anyone wants to talk to me more about that afterwards, then um, I'll be happy to explain. Or my colleague, Francesca. <coughs> Francesca, hand up. There she is. <laughs> or you can talk to Francesca. <laughs> She's hiding in the corner. Right, so that's enough for the business. So today I'm here to talk about design, test, and build business models and value <coughs> propositions. So the reason why Tommy asked me was because a lot of the talks have had at their theme this idea that it's harder and harder to generate money in the music industry. And I think if you start to Google and have a look at this subject, you'll be surprised that a lot of the information on creating revenue streams is four years old, five years old. There's no new knowledge or information because so-called experts within the industry haven't got a clue where things are going. That's literally where things are now. So sorry to start with the bad news, but that's where things are. The internet's just disrupted everything. Um, and as things move forward, nobody really knows where it's going to go. So you can either see that as a problem or an opportunity. So what I'm going to try and do today is show you how to create business models that perhaps can work for you. And it's going to be interactive because um, I think there's probably such a wide, vast range of people in here from different areas in the music industry. It would be good if we could do almost a live case study. It's a bit of an experiment, so it doesn't work. Don't throw anything at me. But if we try and do a live case study, create this imaginary person, entity, whatever it is within the music industry, 
And then maybe between us, we can start to look at different ways they could create income streams, which I think is the thing. It's about creating income streams rather than the traditional model, going to a label, getting signed and getting a huge advance and moving forward that way. Those days are over. So we've got to start looking at the new paradigm, a new way of doing stuff. So first of all, there are probably some people who are singers or performers, and this is really all you want to do. You don't want to be doing social media. You don't want to be going around create, getting your fans and selling stuff to your fans and all the other stuff that people are suggesting as the way forward. Unfortunately, to get to that stage where you do just sing and perform, nowadays you have to do some of the other stuff as well. And you have to start thinking of yourselves as a business rather than just an artist. So that's the bad news. It's a bit of a shame, but unfortunately that's what we have to do. So I'm going to show you a few techniques of how to come up with business models. And it's actually very straightforward and easy. It can be really complicated. I mean, I can teach this for two days. Normally, I teach a two-day course. But I'm going to show you some shortcuts and point you to some resources where you can do it for yourselves in the comfort of your own homes. So first, we're going to try and define a business model. So I'm going to do a poll around the room. And I want everyone to tell me what they think a business model is. And there's no real right or wrong answer. There are a few definitions. So when I ask things as well, this is, another, this is the rule for today. I'm going to point at people, and I want you to talk. Even if it's just to say, uh, I'd like you to talk. Can I point as well? You can point too. <laughs> In fact, I'll probably point at Tommy a lot, because um, he likes to talk. <laughs> so <laughs> definition, what is a business model? Let's start this corner of the room. And you're closest, I've got. To so if you could say your name, what you do, and then give me the answer to the question. Um, uh. There you go. Hi, I'm Lorraine from Success Express Music. What's a business model? Um, I think it is uh, an idea uh, that you uh, generate, you conceive, and then you try to put down on paper into a plan, mm. and then you try to execute. OK. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase. I should get somebody else to write. My writing is terrible. Actually, let's start there. Can I have a volunteer, please? Somebody with nice writing. Tommy, I can always rely on you. Thank you. <laughs> you have to talk to. So you talked about an idea, which you turn into a plan, which you then turn into. Um, um, I'd formulate down into Thank you. break it down yeah. into uh, bite-sized pieces. I think I would do, and then work out how to execute it. Okay. Physically. Right. So idea to plan to execution. Yeah. Let's get that down. Are you all right, camera person with the great. Okay, thanks. That's a good answer. So let's grab I'm gonna grab another three answers. So let's go this side of the room. One of you two young ladies, would you mind? I'll bring the mic over. Here you go. Um, do you want me to introduce who I am or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> introduce who you are, okay. what you do. Um, my name is Kanisha and uh, I'm a singer songwriter. And for me, I think it's a business, what is it, business module? Yeah. Is um, I would say it's a strategy, um, a draft of a strategy um, with ideas, concept of um, something that you're going to put forward. Yeah. Um, maybe like bullet point in where you want to go, where, you, where you're starting off and where you see yourself going right. in, in, in the business that you're trying to execute and put forth. Okay, so strategy, I've got concept. And you said put a yeah, business you want that to yeah, grow into, right? Probably steps. I would say mm. initial, initial, maybe starting off with initial steps. So okay. basically, um, step by step guide kind of structure. Okay, guide and structure, I like that. And step by step. Thank you, Kanisha. And we'll get one more as well. One of you gentlemen at the front would be good. Thank you. Again, your name, what you do would be good. All right, my name is Felipe, and I'm a music producer. Right. And project manager now. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to add, like, it is an idea. It is uh, to execute it to a strategy, but to generate some revenue, that's the business part of the the, the word business. <coughs> it's the revenue. that How are you going to get it? Uh, where's, how are you going to also uh, sponsor it? Yeah. So all this is in the business model. So generating revenue, 
And by sponsoring, you mean how you're going to fund how that, you how exactly, you're going to fund how that you're business model? Fund the business. Okay, so that, I like that. So generating revenue and funds to fund the initial business model. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to give you a definition. This is the one I stick to because I teach it, but um, there are lots. So a business model describes the rationale of how an organization, and you can think of yourselves as organizations, even if there's only one of you doing something, creates, delivers, and captures value. So it's about the creation, delivery, and the capturing of the value, those three steps. So you're creating some sort of product or service. You're delivering it to whoever it is you're making it for. The value you're capturing could be money, could be, um, if it's a charitable project, maybe it's engagement with a certain group of people. However you measure that capturing is how, depends on what you actually do. But it's this idea of these three stages, creating, delivering, and capturing, and the tasks you have to do under each stage. And it's important to think about these three stages at all times. Capture. Capture. So, okay, so let's say I am, I'm running a studio. Once that person arrives, I've, I've reached the customer I want to, he arrives, he does his session, he pays, he leaves, I've captured his value, I stick it in my pocket. So the value, the value he gives me is money, the value I give him is my services. <coughs> so it's an exchange, exchange of value. Does that make sense? Yeah. You don't sound sure. <laughs> Yep, okay. So, today we're going to try and look at how does the music industry create, deliver, and capture value? And whilst it looks a really simple statement, as you guys will all know, there's, it's vast, this industry. It's vast the number of activities that happen. It's vast the, the number of ways that people generate revenue. And what you'll find is that whether you're an artist, producer, performer, whatever your role is within the music industry, there may be one or more ways that you can create value for somebody else. And as I started off saying, nowadays you kind of have to at least be aware of those different ways you could do it. Even if you're not doing them all, at least kind of have an idea of what you could do if you wanted to. So, the tool we use for this is the business model canvas. I probably won't have time to go through the whole thing today, but um, I will give you a slight, a quick overview. And if anyone wants more to know more afterwards, then come see me after or get in touch if you haven't read the book already. The book's called Business Model Generation, and I can um, give you some links to the website and stuff after if you're interested in learning more. So the Business Model Canvas, it, the tool we use to describe, challenge, design, and invent business models more systematically. So it's a system, it's a tool to quickly try an idea out, create a business model around it, and see is it viable before going out and actually spending it funds to actually make it happen. So it's a cheap way of testing an idea, in a way you can test it on paper, which is why it's a great tool. I was gonna show a video, but there's no sound, so what I have showed you would be, would be this. So this is the business model canvas. And it's very visual, very pictorial, but effectively, there's nine different areas that you need to be concerned with. And this, this applies to you whatever business you're in. I so say I teach this to all sorts of businesses, but any business this, this model applies to. That's what the canvas looks like. And the four areas work like this. You've got your customer segments, whether you call them audience, customers, clients, whatever you call them, they are effectively the same person. They're the people that you're trying to capture the value from. They're the people you're delivering the value to. So we put them in this section called customer segments. As I said, you may be an artist or business person or performer who can do more than one thing to different customer segments. And that's something that will come up later. For example, if you're a singer, you might think that making music for my fan base, that's my customer segment, my fans. I'd say, what about um, TV producers who want soundtracks? What about advertisers? These are also customers. So you can have multiple customers 
with one activity you might do. And it's about at least understanding who those different customers are, even if you're not engaging with all of them. You should at least know who they potentially could be. That way you don't miss opportunities. So the second block is customer relationships and channels. And this is about how you relate to these customer segments, what sort of interactions you have with them and how you do that. And we'll be coming to that in a bit more detail later. So the channels are the way that you actually, through, through which you deliver your value. And a relationship sets the parameters of how you're going to be doing that. And I'll come on to that in a bit more detail later. And the most importantly here is your value proposition. <coughs> this is effectively what value are you giving to these people? What is it you're actually doing for them, why they should choose you over somebody else? And you have to have a clear idea of yourself what differentiates you from other people when you're talking to your potential customer. Because otherwise, why should they choose you if you don't know why? So you've got to really have a clear idea of what it is you offer. What's your offer to the market? And even if your customer segment is just an audience, you're still offering them something. And it's about you understanding what that is. It might be giving them music that they can have a good time on a Friday night, but you still have to understand that that's what it is you're offering them. You've got to know what it is that they, they want from you. And then, most importantly, all of this at the bottom, which is supporting all of these activities, it's like the foundation, your revenue streams. This is where you're capturing the value from these customers' segments. And the more revenue streams you can get, the better in some cases. Or you can have one or two really strong revenue streams that support all the other activities. Now, I just want to show you something interesting as well on this diagram. Sorry. Uh, yep. what Sorry. What, sorry? We'll get to that. <laughs> depends on who you are and what you do, really. It does depend on that. So what I want you to notice is if you see this line here, imagine a line. Well, don't imagine it's actually there, but <laughs> trace this line here <coughs> down all the way through there. And what you'll notice is one, two, three, four, five blocks. The five blocks I've just described, they're the bit that your customer, your audience, your fan, whoever it might be, they're the bit. That's their connection with you. That's the touch point of them with you. This stuff behind here is the stuff that enables this stuff to happen that they don't see. It's the stuff you do in the background that nobody sees. These are your key activities. What are the things you're doing on a day-to-day -to -day or week-to-week -week basis that enable you to create value for your customer? Your key resources. What resources do you need to do that? It might be physical resources, it might be cash, it might be time, it might be other people's time. There's going to be some resource you need. Even if you don't have that resource, you should know what it is. This is the whole point. It's not about having it now, it's about knowing what you need to actually to enable you to deliver. Deliver this value to this customer segment. Key partners. Something that's ignored a lot. We should all be in partnerships with people. It's the only way we can make our time worth more. If we're trying to do everything ourselves, it's difficult. But if we're coming together with different people in partnerships, we can get more done. So to me, that's a really important block, especially in this industry. Your partnerships are key. The people you know, not just know, but work with. Actually work with. And I've been doing these events for a while with Tommy. So I know that it's almost, there are groups here where it's almost family away. People know each other and they've got relationships. It'd be interesting to see how many have taken those relationships to working relationships, actually working on projects together. It's an important thing to do nowadays, have good partners that you work with on projects. And then supporting all the stuff you're doing behind the scenes, your cost structure, the costs to make all this, your key activities, key resources, and key partners, to make all of that happen, it's going to cost you something. So it's about understanding what those costs are. If you've got a studio space, it's going to be your rent. It's going to be your light bills, things like this. If you're going out and gigging, it's going to be your transport costs. It's going to be people to help you move your stuff and feeding them. You know, it's going to be all these things that we just spend out but don't think it's a direct cost for our, our business or our business activity. So again, this you know, is costs and your revenue support the rest of the business model. They're the foundation of it all. So it's important for us to understand what they are 
in order to, in this case, make them increase revenue, and in this case, keep them stable or going down, cutting costs, becoming efficient. So that's your business model in those nine blocks. And effectively, with this model, you can describe any business, any organization, any set of activities. And it, it, how you express it is up to you. Maybe you're going to write in it. Maybe you're going to stick pictures in there. Whatever language you want to use is fine. I did one workshop. I had someone do sign language. He described his business model with a translator using sign language. I had someone else just draw pictures. Him. <laughs> He's a good drawer. So how you express it is up to you. So there's no excuse for you not doing this, this paperwork because you could just draw it. And it still has value because you understand it. So again, that's just another, another way of looking at it, where instead of value proposition, I've called it offer. So what do you offer to the market? And instead of key partners, partner network. Who are your partner networks? Define them. Have them in front of you so you know who they are in case you need them at some point. So. I refer to these as building blocks sometimes because I, I imagine it almost as a wall that you're building and the idea is you can remove one block or change the elements and it may affect the rest of your business model or it may not. But the idea is you can just change elements <coughs> as you go along so you can test things, make changes where necessary. And it's important to think of it like this, that it's a living, breathing document in that respect. Uh, good question. Yeah. When you talk about key partners, is it like can you have the, oh, yeah. right. Sorry. The Where's the mic? Over there. There you go. Oh, sorry. Uh, when you talk about key partners, is this just the people that you're, you're going to be working with or the people that are going to be working for you as well? For example, in a, if I want to put on a, a theater show, a play or something, mm. I need people to create the whole scenery, which are going to be my partners, but also the actors who are going to be working for the thing, also my partners, or are they more like key resources? Um, good question. It depends on how you meet your actors, to be honest with you. Um, so if you go for an agency, then the agency would be your key partner. Um, if it's individuals, I would kind of say they could go under either, because you do need them to make the play happen. Key resources, clearly. Of yeah. So. Um, they, they could, in theory, go under either. I don't think that matters. All right. I think that's fine, yeah. And I think also before, it's a, you just actually made me remember something that's, that's quite key to this. If you're doing your business model before you start the project, sometimes just think of the key partners you think you might need. And that's a really good thing to do because you've got a list of people you think, I need to meet someone like this soon. And actively, you will be on the lookout for the kind of key partners you, you need to work. So it's important sometimes even just to have a wish list of people you would like to meet or you need to meet to make something happen. To me, key partners box and this idea of partnerships, it's spoken about a lot, but a lot of people don't actually do it for real. You know, and, um, and by that I mean, okay, you're having problems getting a gig. Why don't four musicians, singers, actors, rappers, whatever, get together and put on a show, promote an event themselves? You know, that's a project that a partnership could bring out. And it's about leveraging those partnerships to make things happen for yourself too. So, I just put a little example up. So this is an imaginary band promotion company or band promotion project. So it's quite simple, I made it quite simplistic for this, but um, you see your customer segments would be Local rock music consumers, they call them. So local fans who like that genre of music, effectively. Um, and that's one segment. That's one set of people. The second set of people, similar, but people who listen online. You're going to reach them in a different way than the people who live locally. So they're different. Separate them. Whenever your customer segment is different in any way, it's separate. It's a new segment. So you can never just say, my fans, which fans, where are they, how do they listen, how do they access your music? You've got to think of it in that way and differentiate them that way. The fans who buy CDs from the ones who stream, from the ones who download, they're all different. They're accessing you in a different way. 
So it's important to, to differentiate whenever you can. Our third customer segment for our band promotion project is local venues. So the venues themselves are your customers, potentially. You could go around to these venues and actually get them to engage with you. And they can eventually move over to become key partners eventually. They could sit in both camps. And you've got UK venues. So for your relationships with these customers, you've got social media. So that's how you're actually communicating with them. That's how you're keeping them in the loop, letting them know what's going on with you. And then the second relationship that you'd have with these venues, local venues and UK venues, would be directly approaching them. So it would be a personal relationship you'd have with them. So again, look how we're differentiating. And you can color code this differently as well. So you could have the consumers as one color, the next set as another color, the next set as another color, the next set as another color. Let's say our venues are in red. Then we might put direct approach to venues also in red. So we can look at the one document and see how different, different parts relate. Our channels, digital music stores, social networks, websites, blogs, web radio and live events. So these are all about the <laughs> listeners and the consumers. These are channels we're going to communicate them through to them, with them through. And then what is it we're giving them? What value are we giving them? Fun, entertainment, live experience, discovery of new music. We're promoters, we're bringing them new bands, new music they haven't heard of. And the second part of our value that we're bringing them, the third part, 70s rock celebration in a modern key. Sounds pretty abstract, but it's the theme, it's the tone, it's, the, it's injecting a bit of fun to the offer as well, as well as making it quite strict and plain. And then our revenue streams, gigs, merchandise, record sales, and then the last one I put as a bit of a wild card, crowdfunding. And we'll move on to that. Obviously, that's something that's really becoming um, <coughs> widely used in the music industry to fund tours and lots of things. I don't know if anyone heard about, um, I was talking with Tommy about this. A band, they, did anyone hear about this band? They, re, they wanted to do a tour and they had no money. So they released the Sleep album. Did anyone hear about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought that was amazing. They did Spotify for 20 grand. <laughs> An album of silence. Told all their fans just have it on loop all night. And made 20 grand. Paid for their tour. Is that sort of thinking, you're think, thinking outside the box a bit. Okay, so we know what we need. We know what we need to do this tour. All we're missing is this 20 grand. How do we get that? I thought it was a great story. I mean, Spotify banned them in the end, but they had no reason to ban them. They hadn't broken the rules. So crowdfunding is becoming increasingly viable to, to get things done. And as I said, this is all the front part that our customers are actually engaging with. But behind the scenes there, we've got our key activities, promotion, organizing tours, selling the record, streaming the concert. All of these are activities we have to do to make sure that these people experience the value we're trying to deliver. Our key resources, internet, venues, fan bases, friends, music quality, so the quality of the music is important, the fact that we've got to have good music. Let's not forget that in all this. You can have the best business model if the music's no good, then... Well, that's not strictly true, is it? <laughs> A lot of bad music does very well. It's not true. But anyway, I put it on there anyway. So live experience is the key resource. The fact that it's a live show is, is what we're selling, so it's... Having a good live performance is key. Make sure we're rehearsing, we're tight, we're looking good, we're sounding good, and the audience are giving us that appreciation. And then our image, that's a key resource. Because how do we get all these fans to engage with what we're doing otherwise? Our key partners, video makers, photographers, web designers, radio stations, and the bands themselves, because we're the promoters in this, in this model. And our costs are marketing, the cost of the gig, and then any staff we have to hire. 
It's a very simple, very simple model of how, you, how to start a band promotion project. And I said we can map the whole thing out on this, on this document and then go into a bit more detail. How much is it going to cost each part? How long would each part take? You know, those are the details we put onto there, but we've got the broad brush view of what we need to be doing. So, I'm going to start now because um, I don't want to put everyone to sleep, so let's get interactive now. I'd like us to try to create a character in the music industry. So, I'm going to take suggestions about who they should be and what they do. And I'd like us to start by giving them a name. I'm just going to delete this. So, we're going to do a business model for this character who is called, give me a name. Pharrell. Big D, not Big D. Big D. Big D. <laughs> Can anyone draw? <laughs> Who can draw? Um, you... can come on, come and draw Big D for me, please. <laughs> big D. What's the Big D look like? With a cup. <laughs> <laughs> my, my draw drawing is very, very draw him just there. Okay. So what does Big D do? Not... Okay. Doesn't work. What does Big D do? Classical music. I like it. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Classical music. Is it he or she? Good question. Is it he or she? Big D. <laughs> Stick a skirt on him. <laughs> there you go. Big D. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that will do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> so we've got Big D. She does classical music. What does she do in classical music? Someone shout out something. What does she do? Does she play something? Does she promote? Does she? She's a music director. We like that. Music director. <laughs> and what is it she's trying to do? Attract young people to classical music. Okay. <laughs> Possibly she was Big Derek before. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Big D, very bad, That's your mind, I think. Okay. <laughs> D's just a letter to me. I don't know about you. <laughs> so, okay, so let's forget Big D for a second. Let's put, let's put Big D on hold. So, the music industry, a dynamic market, some of the qualities it's got, a global industry, characterized by many players and fierce competition. Here's something I want you guys to think about when you think about the state of the music industry at the moment. So, Clayton Christensen, he's, um, he works in Harvard, Harvard professor, teaches business models, and he speaks about companies are quick to adapt technologies that support their business model, but are slow to adopt technologies that disrupt it. I think that's extremely valid in the music industry at the moment because we feel like it's changed a lot, but has it really? Instead of CDs, you get a download. What's the difference, really? The difference for the consumer, for the record company and the industry itself, it's not a huge difference for them at all. In fact, they probably make more money because they sell singles, and it costs them less to, to actually make them. So... Well, unless you don't pay. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, yeah, that is an option. They, they still, still do, do very, very well. well. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, this, the size... Is, imagine this, the cake has shrunk, but you've still got quite a big chunk of it. That's effectively what's happened and well I think what's happened is their chunk will get much bigger because now of course they're investors in the technology behind the scenes so as most of you probably know Spotify owned by two majors um, Deezer one of their biggest shareholders a major so behind the scenes they're very active in getting their hand in the new technology and it's for this reason 
They adopt technologies that support their present business model, not ones that are going to disrupt it. So that's why you saw anyone that was a threat was quickly closed down. This is a prime example. So the traditional music industry gave us the choice of buying singles, albums, or compilations. The digital service most favored by the music industry gives us the choice of buying singles, albums, or compilations. What's really changed? Just the media they use. In other words, the music industry has offered consumers a solution that is most like the one that went before. And, sorry, question. Sleight of hand, I call it. That's <laughs> exactly what it is. It's important to try and make sure mm. that they don't change it too much, otherwise the public who's not who's buying mm. will have to adjust and go to the learning curve. Yeah. But I, I think they don't mind that because um, the public generally will just adopt whatever's given to them effectively. And it's almost for the grassroots, for guys like you guys to change the real music fans, not the people who will buy Justin Bieber or Kate, Katy Perry. I mean, she's got some nice tracks, don't get me wrong. Oh, <laughs> There's, nothing wrong with There's nothing wrong with him, but what I'm trying to say is the model he works under rather than him personally. Yeah. What model yeah. is that? This yeah. traditional music model that involves selling albums and singles through another medium rather than selling CDs. Record label structure. It's a record label structure. It's changed slightly in that now they're actually outsourcing bits of what they do. So now you could get your marketing from um, Sony if you could afford to pay for it. You could get your um, plugging done by um, any of the other Universal if you could afford it. So they've changed that slightly, but major deals are still happening in much the same, in much the same way. I mean, it's just sleight of hand. It's just change of paperwork. You know, what's the difference between me saying, I own you, I own all of you, or I rip this into five pieces and say, I own that, 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 and that. It's very little different, sleight of hand. So, it's just, like I say, the rules haven't changed that much. You know, it's just that there's more opportunity to disrupt and do things differently. Yeah. That's the good news with this. So, this was how the industry looked before, and kind of looks now. So I think most people should recognize this if you're in the industry. I'm sure all of you fit into here somewhere. And this basically held sway for about 70 years, 80 years, this model, something like that. Again, it's a really nice looking model because the artist is in the middle and it, makes, it looks like, wow, the artist is the center of everything. They're the most important part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So who is the, the most important? Record company, if you look at the amount of links, there's four going, five going to the, um, the manager and artist, and manager. nearly twice as much going to the record company. There's, if you notice, there's no links actually going to the artist. Oh, no. They go to the manager. So the manager's, okay. Well, the man manager does all the admin, doesn't it? No, but what about those artists who do really well without a manager? They just do it themselves. It's not always... Because they managers. are their own manager. They, wouldn't be. Oh, so they manage themselves. Manager, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with that, managing yourselves. If you've got a good manager, even better. But I'm just saying that's just how, it, how it's always manifested. Where's the record company? Oh, okay. Record company. Mm -hmm. And again, like I say, all of these parts, they just chop them up now. And you could just buy bits of them, but they still do all of them. So that, that's it. The model hasn't changed dramatically. So these are the changes we've seen in 10 years from that traditional model. These stuff has been added along. Uh, um, people say why that's there. Yeah. Because you could license your music to them and get paid. They teased a couple of people, though. <laughs> I thought it was just... It's all right. You can take them to court. As long as you're, it's your track and you can prove it, fine, steal it. That's a nice paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, you have a question? Oh, yeah, Andrea. Oh, yeah, I was just, oh sorry. I just wonder, you know, like, why that video game? On, on no, it's not. It could be any video game. It's just that one on the slide. 
So yeah, we've had all this disruption, everything from Facebook, Spotify, everyone's expected now to be on Facebook, Twitter, and all these social networks and doing stuff. And mobile has changed the game as well. Um, YouTube is absolutely, is still trying to choke the life out of the industry at the moment. I don't know if anyone knows what's going on with the arguments with the independents and YouTube. Yeah, and the renegotiated contracts they're trying to make. It's affecting more than just music, it's affecting a few other creative industries as well. Yeah, Quite yeah, but I, th I think they're coming down tickly heavily on music because that's one of their biggest products mm -hmm. on YouTube, so they're... The Vigo channels have um, more subscribers than YouTube itself has mm. subscribers. So. But Vivo is just a supplier to YouTube. It is mm -hmm. just a supplier. So it's, it's like... The point being more yeah. music on YouTube is <coughs> than pretty much anything else, really. Mm. That's true. It's more yeah, that's true. But as I said, it, it, the, the issue isn't, isn't the access. I mean, they provide a good service in some respects. But um, it's, the fact is Google don't value, they don't value the content. <laughs> this is the point. They don't want to pay for the content. They're happy to show it. They're happy to make money from it. But don't want to pay for it. Everyone trying to cut their costs. Yeah. Well, you can generate money with the, the ads. It's oh, such a small amount of money. Yeah. Good music. I mean, I've, I've got adverts on my music videos. I'm not making any from it. Anyway, unless. Yeah. 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 Yeah.